Philippa, do you think that the movie ideal of romantic love, of falling head over, over heels and really feeling like this is a life-changing event, has given us the wrong idea about relationships? I think that some people do fall in love at first sight. I mean, lots of us fall in love at first sight, but whether that love lasts is is, is very debatable. I think in certain instances, it does. And this gives everybody else the wrong idea about what love is. Because when we fall in love at first sight, what happens is we're falling in love with our fantasy of who the other person is. Now, it might just turn out that they are that fantasy, but nine times out of 10, they aren't. And we go away very disappointed when things don't work out. So yes, it is mostly a fallacy, the falling in love at first sight. What it is, is, is probably um, mutual um, uh, erotic transference rather than you know anything more beautiful. And I'm wondering, too, whether the speed of Internet dating is causing the opposite thing, the sort of lowering of standards. The thing is, before we had Internet dating, how we met people was because, you know, we shared an interest or a hobby or we're in the same friend group. So rather than this intense coffee meeting, which is more like an interview, are you the one for me? We just hung out together and if we were working with some somebody and it wasn't so much of what we said it was just how we felt when we were with the other person so it wasn't so much relying on words it was relying on words and everything else like the essence of the person how you felt when you're with them and that seemed to make a firmer foundation for a relationship than a quick coffee does um and it does get a little bit like a shopping list. And then even if the relationship does progress to, you know, more than one date, and maybe even if, you know, the relationship gets physical, when it gets difficult, when when the the rose-tinted spectacles come off, as as you know, when your fantasy becomes more of a reality, instead of working that out, because that's difficult, who I am, who you are, who we are together, that's a difficult negotiation. It's so much easier to go back into the infinite pool of partners and uh, find somebody else. So there's an awful lot of ghosting rather than what did you mean when you said that? Did you mean A or B? Sort of like, oh, they must have meant that, oh, I'm off. It's too easy. And also we used to have to be accountable for how we behaved because we, we, we lived in groups of tribes of about 140. And so if somebody got a reputation for, um, you know, two timing, whatever the old fashioned words were or being nasty in a relationship, they'd be accountable to the group and it, it wouldn't do well for their future relationships. Now, you're not accountable to anyone. So ghosting and all those other lovely new verbs are, are rife. Mm. I mean, you write in your book. The book, the book you, you want everyone, everyone you love to read yeah. uh, about the idea of adrenalized love as compared with long, slow building of a relationship. But is that realistic for young people? Well, I'm not saying there's, it's a terrible thing, adrenalized lo love. It's just not quite as reliable as experience with another person. Um, people, I, I did a documentary for, uh, I contributed to a documentary um, to about Picasso recently. And it was taken to me that Picasso was always falling in love, it said. No, he wasn't. He was always getting obsessed is very different. Getting obsessed, the thrill of a chase, that is sometimes called love, but it's not what I think of as love. I think of that as an obsession. And it, it's, it's about self-gratification. It's not about mutual appreciation. I'm wondering where you stand on the idea of the one. Um, 
I, my idea of the one is the ballpark. So find somebody in the ballpark, commit to them, and they become the one. And they become the one because of mutual impact and mutual influence. Like I found someone in the ballpark, sort of same sort of interests, same sort of age, uh, same sort of level of intelligence, fancied them. That's the ballpark. They become the one when you invest decades in them, decades of time, decades of sharing, decades of built up memories. Now they're absolutely perfect because of the time spent together, the time of mutual impact. So we, you know, we might have been these shapes to start with, but you know, after we get we get into a better shape as we go along, because we impact. You know, each other. I'm just wondering, is it always, you know, you talk about not not being fake, you know, trying to be as much yourself, but is it always the wrong thing to try to fit in, you know, with a group or to like to be liked or to be loved? I think um, it's it's not the one or the other, really. I mean, I think we can be authentic and we can be ad adaptive. Mm. So we can, if we go to a completely new culture, like if I go to Japan, I don't think, oh, it's my authentic self to keep my shoes on indoors because that's highly offensive to people. So, you know, you make adaptations to the culture we're in. Now, it's very easy for me to go Japanese culture and and, and British culture, very different when it comes to taking your shoes off or keeping them on. But each family has a different culture. Um, you know, very sort of small, minute things. And I think it's, it's, it's good to be sensitive to that. But I think we can be sensitive to someone else's culture, somebody else's ideals, uh, respectful of their beliefs without losing our authentic self. I think we can do a bit of both. Do you think it's it's sort of um, dangerous that people, maybe not dangerous, but a worry that some young people seem to feel that they must always be accepted however it is that they are behaving or feel it is their natural self? I think it gets a little bit tricky when you're dictated to by the other person about how you're supposed to perceive them. Mm. Like, um, if somebody insists on being they, them to me, mm. I find that so kind of um, dominating my thought processes that I find it sometimes it's quite hard work to get beyond that because I'm rather old fashioned. We didn't they, them people in my day, so I'm not used to it. So it, it's sort of when I'm told how I'm supposed to perceive someone, uh, I think that might be slightly over controlling because I can't tell you what to think of me. You have your own impression of me. You know how you feel when you're with me. I'm not going to tell you how to feel when you're with me. I think we become who we are in relationship with other people people rather than in relationship with an idea that we have with us ab about ourselves and I think we need to surrender a little bit to other people when it comes to things like our identity I don't think I can tell you what to think of me I think you'll think what you think of me I I'm, I'm not going to try and control that yes quite Quite a difficult concept at the moment, though, I imagine. Oh, these things are just fashions. Right. Um, I wonder uh, if it, if there is a sort of, if you have any ideas for any kind of strategy for stopping us jumping to make radical uh the kind of misunderstandings about people, misconceptions of people, um, and judging other people's behaviour. I think um, we're we're not very good at staying with uncertainty. We're not very good with staying with a puzzle or I don't know. And so we like to leap to a conclusion. And 
there's not much we can do about that because it's how our brains are wired to leap to a, a conclusion. Oh, he's in, he's not very nice, or these people are all awful. We love leaping to these conclusions. So I like to say, if you're going to have a fantasy about someone, because that's what these conclusions are, make it a good one. So if you go into a room, just believe everyone is interesting and attractive and pleased to see me, and I'm very pleased to see them. Because that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You go into the room, you go, hi. Now, if you go into a room think everybody here is really boring, nobody likes me, nobody's interested in me, you go into the room like this. You don't catch anybody's eye and you look down. And it, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy too. So rather than leap to any conclusions because of our discomfort with uncertainty, if you can't, you can't stay with uncertainty, go for a good fantasy, go for the best possible fantasy. And my favorite is everyone is interesting and attractive and pleased to see me. I'm, I'm gonna cheer myself up every time I say it. And does it work? It works so well. <sighs> and the thing is about a fantasy like that, you can easily say when you first try it out, um, but it's not true. But neither is the fantasy of everyone is horrible. That isn't true either. That is merely familiar. And we mistake the familiar for truth. That is our big error. So make it a good one. And I mean, I've been practicing this for years now. And it feels, it does feel true. Just like nobody wants to talk to me used to feel true. I'm wondering what you think of what my mother used to tell me, which was nobody's looking at you anyway. No, they're not. They're all thinking about themselves. I mean, that's another fantasy, isn't it? Maybe some of them are, but <coughs> it's it's, be it's best not to have the fantasy that everybody thinks you're daft. Hmm. Um, I'm wondering if you've got any, uh, you know, tips for people listening and watching this for how to make it easier to overcome when things go wrong in relationships, when your heart is broken. Yes, that's, that's fairly, that's fairly tragic. Um, uh, I get, I do get a lot of emails from broken hearted people and broken hearted people who knew it was going to go wrong from the start because they got with someone who said, um, I'm not looking for, um, any anything heavy or a commitment i i don't want to call ourselves uh partners i I, ju I just want uh friends with benefits and that's all i want and the other person goes but maybe i can change their mind and then they don't and then they do go off with someone else and then the person left behind is absolutely broken hearted so my first rule is if somebody says i'm not looking for a commitment at all believe them before you give your heart mm -hmm. and my second rule I think if I have a rule for it is um don't get obsessional if you can possibly help it so of obsession don't mistake obsession for love treat obsession very differently it doesn't deserve the respect that actually loving someone deserves and thirdly, if you are broken hearted and you can't think of anything else and you are crying the whole time, give yourself this time to grieve. You're not only letting go of a person, letting go maybe of your most intimate uh, partner. And it's scary to feel like you're on your own after you've been with someone. So allow your time, allow yourself time to grieve. And uh, not think you have to get over it immediately. It's fine to grieve. It's a loss. And then make sure you don't slip into obsession. I have a great way of dealing with obsession, which is if you are obsessed and you can't stop thinking about someone, I insist that you do think about them in a set time during the day, maybe between three and four or nine and 10 or something. And you have to obsess, write, write your diary then about how you're feeling and obsess, obsess, obsess. And then at the, at the end of the hour, you stop and you stop by concentrating hard on something else. And, and the thing that really works really well is observational drawing. You don't have to be very good at it, but um, if you really, really stare at something and really study it and notice it, 
you can't really think about anything else while you're doing that. So you do a task that needs all of your concentration. So you have that lined up. And um, what this means is when you, you, you get your obsession out of you because you have your hour of obsession, but it means you begin to get control of it rather than the obsession having control of you. And so that is how you get control of obsessive thoughts. And, and that's and the kind of thing you would have said to a client who came to you as a therapist. I did. Therapist. I did many times use that one. And I wouldn't have done if it didn't work. It mm. works. Mm. I notice in the book you talk about how when therapists get together, they talk about therapeutic principles and ideas and patterns and things like that. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, if you if you think it's a good idea for people to know and be kind of familiar with the language more of issues that they may be dealing with. You, we are getting a lot at well doing of people saying, you know, I have this, I have that. Um, no, tell me what, what, why that's not so good, Philippa. <laughs> uh, people um, get hold of the labels and lose themselves. So they they say, I've got this label and and then that takes them away from their actual experience of being. And it's, it is very fashionable at the moment. And people love the labels because um, they've got a list of symptoms with a, with a label attached to them. And uh, it becomes their story. It becomes their why. It becomes their excuse. And it, it takes away a little bit from self-responsibility. I think rather than why am I like this, a much more useful question to ask ourselves is how am I like this? How do I make myself do this? Uh, you know, how do I organize? Say, say um, I can't get a partner because I'm on the spectrum, right? So that's a why. It's much more useful to go, how do I organize myself that I'm not in a lo the loving relationship I want to be? How do I react and behave that uh, repels people and doesn't, and doesn't draw people in? Have a look at your behavior, have a look at your normal patterns of response. And when you're aware of what they are, you have the choice about whether to change them or not. Whereas if you just hold on to your label, then you don't, you're not giving yourself that chance to get to know yourself better. You're just giving yourself that judgment, which is just a full stop. Now, I'm not saying that all diagnoses and all labels are bad or a waste of time. I'm saying they're overused and some of them are, which is different. And finally, I wanted to ask you uh, what you wish that people understood better about seeing a therapist, what they might get from therapy. Um, this is quite an old idea I'm giving out, but it, it still comes up. So I'm going to give it out, which is therapy is self-indulgent and uh, it, just about being in, introspective and looking at your old, own navel. It's so isn't. It's about understanding how you are in the world and how you respond to the world so that you can give more to yourself and give more to others. It makes you less selfish rather than more selfish. Because when you know what the impact of your behavior is having on you and having on others and you have a choice to change it you will change it for the benefit of you and that will benefit others um so i think people think it's about being selfish it's about thinking of number one only it isn't i think someone who is um terribly self-sacrificing and over adaptive becomes more grounded in themselves and someone who doesn't know how to adapt to the world um, becomes more adaptive. It's not one size fits all. It's who are you and how can you get a sense of being you and a sense of belonging? 
and that's good for all of us. That's great. And then finally, I'm wondering uh, if you have any sort of um, great aims for this book. What, if you can think of a kind of perfect reader who you would like uh, to to benefit from this book? I think someone who um, is has run out ideas about how to improve their life and feel stuck. I think it's a good book for becoming unstuck because it's about recognizing the patterns you're in so you can do something about it to change them and that will get you unstuck that's great thanks very much philippa it's a pleasure thank you louise thank you